And so my office is, the regional boards are our clients in most enforcement cases or actions. And so we really are trying to reach down to the regional boards and communicate directly with them. And you'll see we have some protocols in place. But in essence, uh, the people who live out in the regions, they understand the regional board usually is their first line contact and that's where most of the complaints go in. And I, it's several times a week I get a, a rush call from someone out in the region who's responding to a citizen complaint. So there are times when it breaks down, but generally speaking, I'm seeing a lot of referrals come to my office in that way, from citizens to regional board to office of enforcement. Um, the other, one of the other objectives of the enforcement policy is that recognizes there are alternatives to the assessment of civil liabilities, including SEPs, compliance projects, and enhanced compliance actions. And we talked about that last month, so I won't go into great detail, detail on that here today. Um, we also, uh, this is what I wanted to, I uh, mentioned or touched on briefly earlier, one of the things the policy wanted to highlight was the emphasis on recording enforcement data and communicating enforcement information to the public and the regulated community. And we have really furthered that in the last few years with the assistance of Karen Larson and her staff at OWEMA and Eric Oppenheimer and his staff at ORPP doing the annual enforcement report and it's filled with different cards and all kinds of information about the type of enforcement that we take uh, from informal notices of violations all the way through cleanup and abatement orders and administrative civil liabilities. Um, the annual report for 2012 was just posted on our website, on the State Board's website on March 7th and it's chock full of a dozen or more information cards breaking down the enforcement uh, for the WDR's programs, for the MPDS programs, by MMPs, and then within certain sectors within those programs. So a lot of information reporting and coordinating with the two other offices here at the state. Um, with respect to promoting fair, firm, and consistent enforcement, this is the stated objective of the policy, and uh, deterrence is a big part of that, and we encourage uh, uh, positive conduct and voluntary compliance through the use of fair uh, and firm enforcement. Um, one thing the policy does do, which I think is very important, is it recognizes the unique facts that might arise in the regional board context. Certain violations uh, should be viewed consistently throughout the state, but, and yet we still need to be able to allow the regional boards the flexibility to apply the policy uh, in their region on, an, on a basis that makes sense in that region. And I think that uh, what we've seen so far is the policy is working to strike the appropriate balance of becoming more consistent throughout the regions and still allowing enough flexibility for the regional boards to craft specific and appropriate remedies. Um, I wanted to mention, too, that one of the goals of the policies is to promote environmental justice um, and enhance meaningful public participation in the, in the enforcement process. Uh, we actually have a process in every administrative hearing uh, where it, members of the public, NGOs, other parties can uh, in, intervene in the action as designated parties and participate in the action. Um, and we are working with Cal EPA and the other BDOs here uh, on promoting environmental justice enforcement through targeted actions where there are multiple uh, exposures to certain people. Uh, so working with Cal EPA and cooperating on that level. And then at Office of Enforcement, we also uh, promote the consideration of at, uh, at risk populations and their exposures in setting cleanup levels or appropriate cleanup levels in cleanup and abatement orders. So it's a very important concept for us at Office of Enforcement. We're always keeping it in mind when we're looking at uh, uh, using our resources. Um, talking a little bit about the prioritization process, it's basically a two-step process. The first is to rank the uh, violations and we look at whether they pose an immediate and substantial threat to water quality. 
uh, whether they have the potential to cause harmful effects to human health, and also uh, whether they, uh, there's intentional misconduct involved. Um, and then as a second step, um, we shift gears and look at case modules, or basically a case type approach. So we would look at uh, certain factors uh, and groups of violations, and this is a process uh, based on these various factors uh, where we would engage with the regional boards on a monthly basis to talk about uh, the violations or cases that have arisen in their region during the course of that month. I have at least one or two attorneys assigned to each regional board enforcement staff where they can contact that attorney on an ad hoc basis to ac ask a quick question or get very quick advice. And then we have this presence at their prioritization meetings, and this is something that we do in every region now. We have a prioritization meeting every month where they look at things coming up from each of the programs and determine which cases they're going to assign their uh, resources towards. We also, if there's a case where the uh, regional board may think it lacks the specific expertise, or maybe it has the expertise, but that person who has the expertise is engaged in another high priority product, project, we will back up staff in that region with one of Matt's people from the Special Investigation Unit. And we've done a, quite a bit of work uh, um, with SSO enforcement and in other programs recently, stormwater program, backing up the regional board with technical expertise and then making our legal counsel accessible to the uh, enforcement units uh, in each of the regions, not only on a monthly basis, but also on an ad hoc basis. Once a case matures to a point where we've decided to pursue formal enforcement, then a specific attorney is assigned to that case, and it wouldn't necessarily be the, the uh, liaison to that region. In that way, the regions get exposure to uh, all the attorneys in the office and the investigators at special investigations. That's really good, Chris. Thank you for describing that process. It's, it's, it's come a long way since when I was at the line staff level. But I'm gonna, I have a line staff type question for you. Um, are there instances, or if there is an instance, where line staff is not getting its case trickled up through the regional board's enforcement team, is there any uh, way that you know, somebody who's watching compliance on a certain program can actually um, sort of appeal their case to the Office of Enforcement? within our organization. Uh, is there you know, a chance for all staff to have their case heard if they feel like they're not getting enough attention for the reasons they've been indicated? Yes, so the leaders of the uh, enforcement teams or the compliance assurance meetings are the assistant executive officers in the various regions. So they're the ultimate decision makers. Um, when I was a uh, senior prosecutor before I took the position as director, I frequently got uh, inquiries from line staff and had discussions with line staff who approached me to advocate for their uh, particular uh, enforcement case in front of the AEO at the enforcement meeting or otherwise. I encourage my attorneys to do that and I make them available in the region so that line staff can approach them and there's, there is, it's not necessarily an appeal process, but it's a way for line staff to have an alternative sounding board, but ultimately the A, we take our directions from the AEO. The other route that that comes in frequently or the other way that happens frequently is I might get a call from Baykeeper or some other entity that has a high level of interest in the way a prosecution or an enforcement case is being handled. Maybe they feel, believe an NOV was inappropriate because there were two or three issued and that this should be ele elevated. So in those kinds of situations too, those voices can be heard in the prioritization meetings and we can provide a conduit for that. But ultimately, we are not the decision makers in those meetings. Right. Uh, thank you for describing that. I think that's important. It makes us more functional, you know, at every level. And I would say not only uh, the baykeeper type input, but also input from others in the regulatory program. That, and, and I didn't, you know, I'm sure you thought of that. But the idea is that our enforcement presence is needed by to create equity within these regulatory programs. So those who are regulated uh, are not punished, let's say, economically 
for complying while their their other people in the program uh, aren't in compliance. So there's more than one dimension, not just non-governmental organization, but those within the regulatory program as well. And that's a critical element of what we try to do in civil liability cases is capture the economic benefit. And that's been a very persuasive argument in front of every one of the regional boards is to make sure there's a level playing field. And we, ha we do inter uh, interface frequently with industry groups to get input on how to accomplish that. Um, just a few uh, statistics, because I haven't had any statistics yet for you. I wanted to throw out a couple, but we'll go through them pretty quickly. As you may recall, we had the MMP, Mandatory Minimum Penalty Initiative, in 2008. There were over 12,000 pending violations to be addressed, many of which were over 180 days old. Now there are 3,322 violations pending, very few of which are of that age. Many of those are submitted. There's been an adjudicatory proceeding and we're just waiting for a decision, especially the more aged violations. So we try to keep very current on that and as there may be two to 3,000 violations at issue at any particular time, we don't want them to age very much. We want to make sure they're addressed within a year at most, but usually within six months. Um, also, I wanted to uh, report a little bit on the left side of your screen, you'll see the number of ACL actions, and these are penalty actions, but we're not MMP cases. So these are discretionary enforcement actions where we sought a penalty. In the two years prior to the adoption of policy, we were in the upper 80s. We're doing at least 10 to 15% more administrative civil liabilities uh, than we were at that time with the same staffing. So essentially we're looking, or the same staffing at the state board level and Office of Enforcement. So we're doing, we're more efficient under the policy today uh, that I think than we were uh, before it was adopted. And I think the reason for that, and we're still gathering data and trying to make a determination, is that there are very specific parameters and within which findings need to be made. Uh, and so it makes it more efficient when you engage with the regulated public. They have an expectation about how things are going to go because it's very laid out, it's, or it's laid out. Now, that's a, a, a gross generalization, and I don't have a lot of data, but that's just the trend that we're seeing uh, to back it up. Uh, also then, in terms of the amounts collected uh, in administrative civil liabilities, uh, actually, these are the amounts ordered, uh, imposed by the boards, not the amounts collected. Let me be clear about that. In 2008 and 9, uh, before the policy were adopted, we had a, a one very good year, one more average year in terms of uh, monetary assessments. But you can see in the 2011-12 data, uh, those numbers are also up considerably, and that is because of the number of actions, uh, but also some of the data indicates that it's because of uh, a slight rise in the amount of civil liabilities being imposed in each case, mostly because of the number of actions. Um, I mentioned this earlier, uh, and uh, the, the regional boards are the place where fairness, equity uh, is balanced. And uh, we do a lot of uh, resolution of administrative civil liabilities by settlement. In fact, the vast majority of cases are settled. Uh, but the policy recognizes that in a liability determination, regional boards uh, have an ability to reach results that are unique in each case. Each case has a certain uniqueness to it, and although we strive for consistency, there's always a need for that safety valve with the board members to be able to apply the unique facts of each case. Um, now we'll talk about the methodology a little bit, the, uh, what I called, re referenced earlier as an algebraic formula. Um, the methodology is intended to uh, provide fair, consistent, and transparent liability determinations. Uh, a critical point for us and the regional boards is to eliminate any economic or com competitive advantage obtained from noncompliance. And then we want to make sure that civil liabilities outside the MMP context, where we have no control over it, uh, bear a reasonable relationship to the gravity of the violation the harm to beneficial uses, and the integrity of the regulatory programs. Um, and so the 
the penalty methodology accounts for each of the factors that's enumerated in the specific statutes, Water Code Sections 13385 and 13350. But in each case, we go through and we, each of those factors is represented by a variable. And here's where I'm going to try not to get into the weeds too much, but I'll show you some interesting, the way we get into it. Um, a, a note about separation of functions before we proceed, it's something that my office uh, takes very seriously and it's based on the principles of due process. The regional board or your enforcement staff uh, comprises a prosecution team. If you were to adjudicate uh, or decide a, a penalty action yourself, the state board, uh, you would be considered neutrals. We would have no ex parte communications with you. Uh, the advisory team may very well be these gentlemen sitting to my right who would advise you and I would present the case on, and my staff on behalf of the prosecution team as would a prosecutor. We separate functions in that way so that we can have fair hearings where there's no accusation of bias. I love this diagram. This is a flow chart of an ACL enforcement process. We start at the top. Um, and it describes basically how we go through or how the staff goes through uh, the process of preparing an administrative civil liability complaint and action. And I'm not going to uh, go into it in great detail, but you can go down a couple of paths. One is the path to a hearing, and that's the path, as you can see, on the right-hand side of the, or excuse me, on the left-hand side of this uh, exhibit. Um, and that's where the enforcement staff and the discharger have a, a disagreements about the assessment of the various factors. And we go through that and, and uh, proceed to uh, issue an order. If we're close and we engage in settlement negotiations and we decide to settle the case and resolve it in that way, we would uh, uh, negotiate with the discharger and present to the relevant board a stipulated order and settlement agreement after an opportunity for public comment, then the board would potentially enter the settlement agreement uh, as an order. And we memorialize all agreements now as orders. Uh, and that makes them enforceable administratively to a large extent. Um, so stipulated orders are negotiated by the enforcement staff and office of enforcement led by the assistant executive officers in each region. Uh, with the exception of Region 5, where Pamela Creedon is the chief of the enforcement team there. Um, we negotiate those uh, uh, orders and agreements consistent with the penalty methodology. So we use that uh, before we engage uh, with the dischargers. Uh, stipulated order memorializes the obligation of a discharger to pay and to uh, engage in compliance projects, and then it also can provide for specific actions by a discharger that would be required to attain compliance in addition to the payment of penalties. Um, frequently, let's see. Okay, maybe I'm going too fast now. Oh, there we go. Frequently, uh, well, what always happens is there's a waiver of the right to a hearing. Frequently, though, there is a hearing that takes place if there are objections to the settlement. A settlement usually has no admission of liability, uh, but we can use it as an evidence of a prior enforcement action or history of violations, potentially. The stipulation is between the discharger and the prosecution team, and then it becomes a regional board order upon adoption by the regional board or its ex executive officer after an opportunity for public comment and after the settlement agreement has been noticed. Um, so the penalty methodology itself relies on the use of matrices to arrive at initial liability. The matrices are based on the potential for harm to the environment and then deviation from the requirement. Uh, we use different matrices for uh, uh, discharge violations versus reporting violations. But I will say that the uh, uh, matrix or the algebraic formula is heavily weighted now uh, in favor of uh, potential for harm to the environment. That's what ends up costing the most, so to speak, in the assessment of an administrative liability. Uh, under the 2002 policy, all the factors uh, were lumped together and to be considered uh, by the board 
and it would be unusual for the board to uh, a board to have made specific findings on each of the factors although it wasn't out of the question um, normally they just said we consider the statutory factors and we find this um, now all the factors have to be considered independently and you can see here this um, let's see here Am I jamming up? Can you forward me one? There we go. Here's the flow chart, and this was created by um, the Region 2 staff, Steve, uh, when you were on that board, uh, and with the assistance of Bruce Wolf, who made the first, one of the initial presentations on the enforcement policy to the board members. And essentially, it goes through the process that we use when we calculate a civil liability. If you look at all the, the uh, on the lower left there, uh, factor one, factor two, factor three, those come right out of the statute. There are 10 things in this matrix that we use that come right out of the statute. Harm to beneficial uses, toxicity of the discharge, susceptibility to clean up and abatement, culpability of the discharger, cleanup and cooperation, history of violations, economic benefit, ability to pay, and the all-encompassing other factors as justice may require. So all of those are considered in our formula, and essentially uh, findings are made in each of these area and in, in each of these boxes, and then the final liability amount uh, is determined. That's the recommended liability about amount, where we would start with at Office of Enforcement and with the Regional Board uh, Enforcement staff. So again, we went through the three first three factors, and this is, as I said, it's heavily weighted. This is where you come up with a score between one and nine by assessing the harm to uh, or potential harm to beneficial uses, the toxicity or characteristic of the discharge, and the susceptibility to clean up an abatement. And then you take the number that you come up with there, and you multiply it by a factor that's or a, a, a a matrix that is set forth on page 14 of the enforcement policy and it tells you how much you're going to come out with in terms of an initial uh, liability assessment. The matrix has three numbers that you could multiply this nine by. One is for minor deviation from the requirement and that means the violation occurred but the uh, requirement was generally intact. Um, the second means that the uh, requirement was violated, uh, but it remained partially intact, and that's a moderate violation. And then the third, for major violations, we would multiply this uh, sum number from harm to the environment uh, times that number if the uh, requirement was basically rendered ineffective. So if there's a discharge prohibition on raw sewage and you have a spill of raw sewage, then the requirement would be rendered ineffective. If it was partially treated effluent, then we might consider the, the, um, the requirement only uh, partially compromised in that situation. Um, then once we have the total, we multiply these figures and we come up with the total base liability amount. Uh, and then we look at these other factors and we apply them to that number. And so we look at the discharger's ability to pay and continue in business. And if that is, uh, if that person or that uh, entity is uh, put at, at a severe financial hardship, uh, we may warrant a reduction in the proposed liability. Um, then we look at uh, the other factors as justice may require, and here is where we have recommended to the regional boards that they add uh, the staff costs for enforcement and try to recover those staff costs. Uh, then we look at the economic benefit to the violator, and we compare that with the proposed liability, and if the proposed liability is greater, then we go with the proposed liability, and if the economic benefit is greater, then we go with the economic benefit. So this is a gut check on to make sure that we're capturing the economic benefit and that our matrix isn't resulting in a penalty that makes economic sense to the regulated public. 
Then we always put forward for the board's consideration the maximum and minimum liability amounts. And um, if everything is worked appropriately, we're in between those. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it usually is. Um, oh, one, one back. Oh, I lost a slide. So then what we look at, um, we look at the culpability of the discharger. So if the person's engaged in intentional misconduct, we're going to have a very high multiplier. It could be up to 1.5 times the uh, initial liability amount. If they're negligent or passively negligent, we might go closer to one or a slightly higher uh, multiplier. We also look at cleanup and cooperation. People who respond to an incident uh, effectively, at swiftly and efficiently get a credit against the liability. And then we also look at history of violations and where the party or entity has a history of multiple violations we'll multiply that uh, base liability by 1.1. So we'll increase it by a factor of 10% for recidivists. Uh, because they've sort of demonstrated they need a little extra uh, incentive. Um, okay. We use this spreadsheet and we allow the board members to use it and you put in the numbers from the uh, findings and it assists with the calculation of the proposed civil liability. I just wanted to present an example of that, but it's a very helpful tool so board members can actually see uh, their work and so can the public. These are attached to all of our complaints and settlement orders. Um, and again, then we talked uh, briefly about the uh, alternatives to assessing monetary liabilities. The enforcement policy has standards and reporting requirements for these types of alternatives. And again, we talked about that last month. These are some of the links where you can get reports, uh, the annual performance report and the 2012 uh, uh, enforcement report are both available now on the State Board's website and again the information on the 2012 report is the 2012 report is just out it's really fresh off the presses I think of the published date on that was March 7th so we're doing a, a lot of tracking and reporting about our efforts and which programs they're in which regions they're in and so in conclusion I wanted to say that um, there are quite a few terms and provisions in the enforcement policy that we're learning more about. Uh, for example, we have some guidance on when to apply a high volume discount for very high volume discharges. <clears throat> we have some people asking for more specificity on that guidance, while others would like it to remain somewhat ambiguous and flexible. So we have several provisions like that in the policy where we're gathering data, input, and information uh, we've really only been having matters tried by the boards for about two years because it takes about a year for an administrative civil liability action that's going to actually try by the board and not go through the settlement process. It takes about six months to a year for those to happen. So we're continuing to gather get data and comments about the various provisions in the policy that might meet, need revision. Uh, and uh, we would be prepared to come back in uh, after we've had a uh, little bit more opportunity to gather more information uh, and make potential recommendations on amendments uh, and to the extent they might be needed. But at this point it seems premature as we're just gathering enough data to be able to document trends uh, and decide which kinds of provisions may need more guidance and which pro kinds of provisions may need to be loosened. So uh, with the input of the regional board members uh, and the enforcement staff and the public. Chris, I would think going forward if you decide that it makes sense to have discounts for volume, I would call it something else. <coughs> yes. Some, somehow discounts and, and uh, punitive actions don't seem to we don't meld it, very that. We don't call it that. They don't emulsify very well. Uh, could I ask, uh, for, for some of our regions, they're, they are disproportionately poor. <laughs> the people who live there are just not wealthy. Is that like in Redondo Beach? Not Redondo Beach. No, I, no they, they deserve everything they get. Um, th this formula doesn't, 
even though there is a an ability to pay component, it's a, it's a it's one, only one component of ten. And uh, so, what do you do? And particularly, I'm, I'm thinking Region 6, and I'm thinking parts of Region 1, and, um, mo but mostly Region 6. Well, there are, there are a couple ways to approach, uh, and you identified one, which is to look at the ability to pay. And if you have small community service districts with low number of uh, low income and a low number of hookups, those uh, entities don't have great ability to pay. What we like to do, or what the regions do, and particularly one and six that are adept at this, and seven also to some extent, those three regions do a lot of their prioritization work, steers those kinds of communities into the MMP world where they can use the civil liability money for, uh, to en enhance or improve their compliance. So that it, as you know, that's uh, allowed in small disadvantaged communities. And so, and Region 5 actually does a lot of work in small disadvantaged communities too through the MMP enforcement tool, which allows the penalty money to go back to benefit the discharger directly. So there are different ways that that can be approached. Some of it's in the discretionary prioritization process. Some is in how you prepare and try the action. Will it be MMPs versus discretionary? And then finally, at the end of the day, there's always that opportunity to look at ability to pay. Appropriate time to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was great and very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, what are your thoughts on closed session? You know, you still have to hear from your executive director. And I actually have questions director. on the executive director's report. So my recommendation would be we're pretty close to an 11 o'clock event, and I would probably hold off on closed okay. session until 11 o'clock, although or until after 11 o'clock, although my recommendation would be before the board uh, takes a recess, I'll have to make the appropriate closed session announcement. Okay. <laughs> well, Charlie, for the last time, you've forgotten <laughs> the executive directors. <laughs> um. I didn't forget it. I was waiting for Mr. Lawford to clear the microphone. I see. Don't, yeah, I, so let's see. Uh, it's not in the executive director's report, but yesterday I testified at the Environmental Safety and Toxic Materials Committee uh, meeting along with Gordon Burns, the undersecretary. And uh, the message from Gordon was to the legislature was that the administration would have a proposal in May. Uh, I believe the intent is to put the, whatever the proposal is into the May revise. Um, and uh, so we have Liz Haven is here right now, and she is the lead person at the Water Board and is acting as lead for Cal EPA as well in terms of putting together the uh, materials that define what we think about the p potential proposal of bringing uh, Department of Public Health either to the Water Board or to agency. So I don't know if there's any questions on that, but. I guess I should think about making flippant comments in front of the secretary about coveting uh, the Department of Public Health portion of the state revolving fund, shouldn't I? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, uh, there's an item on the executive director's report regarding suction dredging. Uh, I signed a letter to the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife we were asked uh, by legislation to uh, identify how we thought that it would be possible to mitigate the uh, impacts that were identified in the EIR that was prepared for uh, suction dredging. And the letter said that we were not, uh, we did not believe it was possible to mitigate for the mercury impacts. Uh, to suction dredging and therefore recommended that the moratorium on suction dredging be uh, extended indefinitely. Mm -hmm. So that letter was sent to Department of Fish and Wildlife. Tom, is it unusual on something like that to just leave it as a moratorium without having some legislation or some more direct policy than a moratorium? 
I always thought a moratorium was for a more finite period of time, and this looks like it's kind of come down to perpetuity to me. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how exactly the process is going to wind uh, down, but yeah, at some point, I guess it's not a moratorium. It's a, a termination of the capacity to suction dredge in the state. I understand, surprisingly, that uh, they are suction dredging again now. Uh, it's just that they've taken out the, uh, what, what, uh, the sluice bugs. Because if you look at the definition of suction dredging, it includes a sluice box being part of the apparatus. And so they have changed the apparatus to eliminate the sluice box, but they still go in and suction dredge as they were doing before. And uh, so now I guess they have to go in and change the fishing game regulations to take out the uh, requirement that there be a sluice box on the suction dredge apparatus in order for it to be suction dredging. Uh, Rick, I hope you didn't sprain your ankles stepping on a discarded sluice box. Um, another thing, for the first time in the executive director's report, we have uh, a, uh, some information on the low threat closure policy and its implementation. Uh, we're moving forward, and uh, as I understand it, everyone's going to be done with, uh, by August, uh, evaluating all the existing uh, tanks to see whether or not they could be in conformance with the low threat closure policy. Still a lot of work left to be done to actually close uh, these facilities. Uh, I signed this week the first two. Uh, that came to me from the, they were both in Alameda County. So I've only seen two so far, but I'm told there's a whole bunch in the, uh, you know, in the pipeline right now. And uh, I asked Liz to come in case there were any questions on that uh, issue. It also in the underground storage tank, we've put out uh, a communication plan and a plan to improve our processing time for claims, both of which I think have been problems in the past and we're trying to strengthen our approach. Uh, if, did anyone have any questions on the underground storage tank issue? I do, and, and Liz has been forewarned that I will be asked this, thing, this question. Um, first of all, let me thank Liz and all the staff and the regional boards as well as the LOPs and LIAs for for their focus on this, I've been um, I've been um, tracking this closely, and I'm very pleased with a few exceptions in terms of the the results so far. I guess my question to you, Liz, looking at the cases that have been reviewed where the low threat criteria have been made have been met, have been determined to have been met, um, we've only closed 21 percent of those that have been determined to have met the criteria by the regional water boards, I'm sorry, I'm sorry 21 by the LOPs, and even less, 16% um, of those cases identified by the regional water boards as being met the criteria have, un have been closed. Why is that percentage so low? Uh, good morning, Liz Haven with the Division of Financial Assistance. And I think you raise a good point, uh, Board Member Dota. The um, agencies are closing cases outside of the um, policy criteria in many cases. Um, on the report, there's a column that indicates mm -hmm. the cases closed under the low threat closure specific criteria, and then another column to the right that indicates the total cases closed. And that column to the right, the total cases, is larger than the under the criteria. And um, our sense, both from our own staff's work on this and from what we've heard, is that in many cases this is because of the um, notification requirements that were imposed by the low threat closure Was that policy. the 60-day notification that requirement? That is one of the changes that the policy made over existing statute and regulations, um, which had provided for only a 30-day previously and now it's 60-day. Another change, um, many agencies did not notify the owners and occupants of adjacent properties. And um, that has caused some consternation, especially you can imagine if there's an apartment building or something and you have to notify the occupants of that building. 
Another um, new feature of the policy for notification was for the agencies that issue building permits. This is not, to my knowledge, required by any existing statute, um, so it's new. And building permit agencies is just not something that we have a directory of statewide, so it's been um, an additional thing to deal with with the policy. I think those are good things to sort of flag <clears throat> should we ever have a need to revisit the policy at some time in the future. Yes. Um, built in, you know, all the lessons learned that, that we have this go around. Um, my other sort of note, and I won't put you on the spot by asking you to answer why, but looking at the LOP chart, um, with only what four months left or so, five. five there are still there are still seventy three percent of cases left that either are still undergoing review or have not even um, started the review yet, that's quite a bit. The regional boards have done a good job. I think they only have about 45% left. Um, but 73 is a lot of cases by the LOPs. Yes, we are now at about, uh, we have five months to go out of the one year provided for in the policy. So that's 58% of the year. So that's a good number to sort of compare. And I agree that the regions are doing very well. They've reviewed, I believe it's 64% of their cases at 58% of the year. So that's a good performance. And they've closed um, at a good rate as well. The LOPs maybe not quite so much. Um, I will note that the LIA table is something that um, is going to be not applicable fairly soon, as you recall, with AB mm -hmm. 1701. There won't be any LIAs as of January or July 1st. They'll all be either LOPs or cease to uh, function in the program. Well, I will remind our executive director that I, as part of, I believe, the LOP certification criteria that this board adopted, um, one of the factors to be considered is review and closure of these cases under the policy. So as you make your determination in August, I would uh, strongly encourage you to keep that in mind. Thank you. And will you be making a, a re well, will this uh, turn up in, in the next report or in, in a report over the next five months, which LOPs are deciding to just opt out? Because that's what I'm hearing, is that a lot of them are, are going to opt out, and therefore that workload will go to the regional boards. Well, I should note this is under DWQ lead, and I believe Vicki is here if she wants to add anything. My understanding is that most of the actual LOPs are attempting, to, you know, have applied to continue with their role and to continue to receive uh, contract funding from the state board, which is now under DFA. Um, I believe many of the LIAs, however, are opting out. No, go ahead, finish. Go ahead. Actually, I had a question on something else other than... No, I had it on something else, too. So you go ahead. You're on a roll. Oh, thank you. I can maybe do a me, too. So <laughs> uh, on uh, two other items in your report, Tom, on the desalination and the trash amendments, uh, staff report that anticipating amendments, draft amendments to go out in the spring of 2013, as my nose and eyes and ears and sinuses and all these allergy symptoms have been telling me for weeks now that we are indeed in spring. Um, <laughs> I was wondering, when are those things going out? Could you please provide a more firm estimate of those dates? No, I can't provide a more firm <laughs> estimate, but I can say that um, as we um, work towards the completion, and we're pretty close to being completed with the SED and the documentation. We have uh, encountered in both of those two instances that we need to, to address. One is that for the trash, we are going to do a rollout in, in April. So though the documents are substantially done, my expectation is that in that rollout, we will learn where we made um, inappropriate or in uh, we made errors in our assumptions that we should correct based on input from the stakeholders. I mean, that's the point of that. And so my expectation on that is that it would be in um, June, July time frame by the time we do that. But um, I can't give you a firm date today on the trash, but that's the issue. 
And in the um, so the next executive director's report will show that as early summer then. <laughs> well, I still think of June as spring, but maybe I'm a, a okay. A, um, but I will keep you up to date, and we'll keep the director's report up to date as we get more information on on how those things are moving forward. The desal policy, as you remember, um, we had a workshop on that. Um, West Basin proposed some additional um, um, panel of experts, and we also received some additional science questions from the uh, folks representing Poseidon. We have got that contract now in place, and so we are doing that science panel now. Um, it took us a little longer than expected to get the funding and get the contract in place, but my expectation is we'd have the information back from that panel in June. I don't know today what the, um, hmm. how long it'll take, because I don't know what they're going to say. Um, but those are the two issues. I, I don't consider them as, um, you know, really as that we slowed down as so much as that we took into account external things that needed to be addressed. And I will keep the board up to date. These are two of the highest priorities that, that are on my plate. And so. John, before I leave, you should stop by my office because in Sutter County, we are really light years ahead of the state on trash policy. My wife rolls the trash out every Sunday evening and it simply disappears. It's a very simple process. It's, We're going to work on that. It's not complicated at all. I just occasionally need to remind her and it's done. So. Be sure and check in, okay? I think that was the chair volunteering his wife to help us out. <laughs> <laughs> there, there won't be a conflict of interest then. Mm -hmm. I, I just on the on the decal. Did you add a resource economist or some additional advice about uh, on the on mitigation fees? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. I can find out for you. Right. Though. Thank you. I just had a quick question on the, you, you talked about the hearing this week that was on the structural aspect of the legislation on um, the Department of Public Health. Are there hearings scheduled about the different fee proposals for the issue as a whole or sort of over time? Or this one was strictly about the structural? Yes, uh, you're talking about fee, fees uh, associated with uh, drinking water for disadvantaged Thank communities. Yeah. There is a hearing scheduled for April 2nd. Uh, to address that issue. Uh, I had been asked to testify, but I'm going to be in Denver for the Western States Water Council. As it stands now, John uh, has offered to take uh, our place in that, but of course, if you'd like to do that, uh, we <laughs> would be happy to have you uh, testify for the water boards. I'll look at my calendar. All right. I'm sure they would prefer having you. <laughs> With that, Thanks. we're going to take a five-minute break, and then we are going to take another break, essentially, until 1 o'clock, and we will go into closed session to handle um, both the um, issue of the United States Department of Interior, Bureau of Indian Affairs, and Morongo Band of Mission Indians on a re proposed revocation of license uh, 659, and then we will deal. <coughs> in closed session additionally uh, and receive uh, legal advice concerning the Natural Resources Defense Council versus Salazar uh, in the U.S. Court of Appeals, Ninth Circuit, case number 09-17661. Terrific. The one item I would add is that Board Member Marcus is recused from the consideration of the second item. That is correct. And when we return, I will get the lovely pleasure of being t able to say to Charlie, while he's sitting here, I'm in charge.
piece of that. Could everyone, could everyone please uh, have a seat? Come forward and sit as, uh, okay. Could everyone please come forward and have a seat? I think we're going to uh, 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 hold the dessert till, well, at least till everyone is seated, and then we'll see who has to just rush back to the back and get their cake first. Although, I know. If there's some cheesecake back there, Lisa, hold a piece for me. <laughs> okay, let's get started. This is what we all came to work today for. It's the recognition of Charlie Hoppin, our chair. And uh, they, we have many, many things that will be um, be doing today, so I want to give you a sense of what's coming up. We're going to have a, a few uh, presentations from uh, from Tom, from myself, uh, on behalf of the board, and then some special gifts from the board, from Felicia, from uh, Barbara Evoy and Vicki. Uh, we will have an opportunity for comments. I think we're going to have a one-minute rule on the comments. <laughs> I, we don't want to be here all all day, um, and then uh, after comments, we will have um, a brief video. And if you don't stay for that, you've made a mistake. <laughs> and then finally, uh, we will. Uh, if there are any refreshments left, we will have refreshments. And um, oh, actually, we will let Charlie. He will do it anyway, so we will make time for Charlie to do a rebuttal. So th th <laughs> that will come at the end. Okay, let's start with Tom. Well, Charlie, we have the obligatory resolution from the California legislature. And we sent them all kinds of interesting anecdotes about you, but uh, they deleted all of them because I guess the dignity of the Senate would not allow them to uh, put it into a resolution. But I, I did, in reading the resolution though, I think uh, it's really uh, pretty impressive because Charlie, you've been a leader in so many different ways in the state. Uh, you know, when I read through this, advisor to Governor Pete Wilson for the 1997 California flood recovery effort, I've, you know, seen your tractor and your pictures, and so I guess you decided to go out and try and do something about it. Member of the board of the Sutter Mutual Water Company, uh, member of the state board of food and agriculture, he was chair of the California Rice Industry Association, uh, obviously. Oh, he was also on the State Water Resources Control Board and uh, California State University Advisory Committee and Board of Directors of the Farmers Rice Cooperative and uh, fi fi finance chair and vice chair of the board. You know, very, you know, you've been quite an asset to the state of California, Charlie, and we really appreciate everything, and the legislature apparently does as well, since they've... I, I think they're probably they've just tickled to death and <laughs> gone, and they don't have to have any more of those acknowledgments, probably. Yeah, you know, on a personal level, it's been great having your perspective at the board, and for me personally, I've never known anyone in production agriculture, and uh, having listened to all your stories, I almost feel like I've... Uh, 
participated in some of that, but I, I actually haven't. Uh, you got to participate in some of the bounty. <laughs> yes, that wife. is true, and, uh, and I'll miss all the bounty as well. But uh, I'd like to thank you, too, for your generosity to me personally and to your gracious uh, uh, demeanor. Uh, and, uh, you know, like I say, you've been a great chair, and I really appreciate it. So thank you. Next, uh, we have the presentation of the uh, board member resolution, and I don't have it. I have the, the, I will read the paper, but where is the thing itself? Oh, there it is, okay. <laughs> right, we will ask for an, a, a special appropriation for, uh, <laughs> right. What the, what the legislature wouldn't use, we did. So here we go. Uh, where, whereas uh, Charles, i just not sure about that one, Charlie R. Hoppen has served the state of California as a member of the State Water Resources Control Board since June 20, uh, 2006 and as its board chair since March 2009, and whereas uh, Charlie Hoppin guided the State board, Water Board through a series of challenging decisions that required him to draw from his diverse experiences, including those gained as a partner in his family farming operations in Yolo and Sutter counties. And whereas Charlie Hoppin possessed a knack for working with a wide variety of interests and counts people of all political stripes and backgrounds among his confidants and friends, and whereas Charlie Hoppin, despite self-deprecating comments, displayed remarkable intellect, attention to detail, and a grasp of the most complex issues before the board. And whereas Charlie Hoppin treated every person addressing the board with great respect and an open mind, regardless of their positions on matters in front of the board, although he also exhibited extraordinary grace and ability to tell someone to stop talking, in the most respectful way imaginable. And whereas Charlie Hoppin demonstrated both commitment and responsibility to engage disadvantaged communities and to provide them with modern water and wastewater services necessary to protect their health and safety, and whereas Charlie Hoppin's fiscal prudence ensures that financial resources to fund wastewater projects and cleanup and abatement activities will extend long past his departure from the board. And whereas Charlie's intellect, experience, wit, and charm enriched the board meetings and the ultimate decisions of the board, and whereas Charlie Hoppin delivered evacuation announcements with a flair unparalleled <laughs> in the history of the State Water Board, and whereas Charlie Hoppin attributes his ability to balance the demands of his position to the support of his wife, Kathy, who is in the audience, and uh, I'll ask you to stand up at, uh, when, we, when I finish, and daughter Kelly, and son Casey, who's not with us today, and whereas Charlie Hoppins' humor and com camaraderie will be missed. Therefore, be it resolved that his colleagues on the State Water Resources Control Board thank Charlie Hoppin for his many years of service, wish him the best in his future endeavors, and will truly miss him. Thank you, Charlie. I, I, I can't tell you how much more that means to me than what came from the Senate. I, that struck an emotional chord that I'm fighting as hard as I've fought anything in my life, but thank you very much. And will, could you two come up and be in the picture? 